the Owens Valley, three hours north of Los Angeles. It's an ancient place where precious history is being disturbed. The vegetation all died and the sand started blowing away, so what's left here is a big depression. Kathy Bancroft is Native American, a descendant of the Paiute and Shoshone tribes. For generations, her ancestors have been buried right here. It's a secret and sacred place. Do you know how old the burials are? We've got um, some that are thousands of years old, and then we've got some that are, you know, within a generation or so of us. But decades of water mismanagement and severe drought have caused the unthinkable, uncovering the dead. Whole burials are becoming uncovered. So these would have been six feet underground mm -hmm. at one stage. Yeah. And you've lost all of that because it's turned to dust and blown mm -hmm. away. Yep. And with that comes the worst kind of souvenir collectors, grave robbers stealing a people's history. You know, imagine your grandmother being buried and somebody coming and digging up her burial. But you've also got the artifacts. We believe that those artifacts still belong to that person that left it sitting there. And so that's something that we've never bothered. But you have people that come, oh, I found this, you know, and they think they need to take it for some reason. Our stories, our creation stories, are built on these mountains and places around here. And that's what I always beg and plead. It's like, how do I teach those stories and our history and our culture to my grandkids if you've destroyed them all? This whole area was once a huge lake, complete with crisscrossing steamboats. And it's here that California's water wars began. A hundred years ago, in a massive engineering feat, the valley's underground river was diverted to the thirsty new city of Los Angeles via a 300-kilometer aqueduct. Owens Valley made LA rich, and the lake turned to gray dust, drawing battle lines between the haves and the have-nots. When it comes to water, a lot of people call us a colony of LA because the city of LA owns a big portion of the land here in the Owens Valley. And um, it's really interesting because they own it, but we have nothing to say about it. And they just do whatever they like with our water and the land. Owens Dry Lake became the biggest source of dust pollution in the entire United States. And now Los Angeles has to pay to control the dust. So far, they've spent more than $1.5 billion on things like water sprinklers. And has it made a difference? Yeah, it's made a big difference. Uh, this valley was pretty bad sometimes and you couldn't see anything because the dust was so bad. And we kind of all grew up with that and we've got a lot of breathing problems and stuff. They've been working on it and we have seen a really drop in the dust problem. Over 80 billion liters of water a year used to control dust. On the other side of the Sierra Nevada mountains, the historic five-year drought brought third world conditions to the farming community of East Porterville. Here, they rely on wells, and even though California had a deluge of rain earlier this year, backyard wells remain mostly dry. So locals have come up with a range of clever tactics to combat the water crisis. For Angelica and for her family, water is so precious they won't waste a drop. Tell us about your uh, dishwashing routine here then. Okay. Just a little thing. This is to cover it, my sink. And when I'm washing my dishes, you know, it's gonna get a little bit of food. When it gets full, I recycle my water. Then I do my floor, and then I'm done mopping my floor, I give it out to my plants. 
So I'm doing three recyclings right there. What do the plants think of the dish? Oh, they are happy. And Yelika and her family have been surviving without a well for over four years. Tell me about when it went dry. Would you remember the day it went, your well yeah, went dry? Yeah, yeah, I remember the day it went dry. It was on a, one of those hot days, and we just woke up um, one morning, and there was completely like sand coming, you know, through the faucets, and really dark water, brownish water, muddy water. The community lives off bottled water and tank deliveries from water trucks. Almost a hundred years old, Vicky never thought it was possible for her hometown to run out of water. I lived here 66 years, and my, I was born 1920, and I'm 96. You were saying that, that this is the most difficult time you've had living here because of the water. I have to say yes. Could you describe what the garden used to look like? Take us around the different trees that you used to have. Well, yeah. right here, I had two plums, one there, one there, and then nectarines, and then uh, two nectarines, and then um, apricot. Three, four, seven. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Vicky's backyard orchard was her pride and joy for more than 60 years. Now it's gone. No, I just go out there and a lot of times I get to crying. I'm a crybaby. Well, you'd cry too if you'd have flowers like I did. East Porterville sits in the middle of the biggest agriculture producing county in the United States. Whilst the corporate-owned farms in the area have the funds to dig deep wells, local residents like Angelica are rationing bottled water. My kids don't drink a whole bottle like this. So instead of giving this big bottle to them, you know, I, I give them a small one because I know they're gonna drink this one. So what's it like having to ration out the water for your kids? They get mad at me, you know, they get mad, they get frustrated, you know, because my daughter said, mom, why can't we have a normal life, you know? Why it's this so complicated? It's, it's really hard. Everyday battles over a basic necessity. Me and my husband, we kind of like talked about it so many times. And even my girls, you know, mentioned it. Well, why don't we just move, you know? We're to the city where there's plenty of water. But, I mean, it's, it's easy to say, I mean, let's move. But when you realize that you're stuck here with the property, that in the future, it has no value. And it's just like, we can drop everything, you know? Especially when this is your community, you got your neighbors that you know for, I mean, that you bombed for so many years, you know, just really hard. You're stuck. Honestly, you're stuck. Yeah. This is a tight-knit community, and the drought has pulled them together in unexpected ways. You know, some of the homes that they're out of water. So we're gonna stop right here in this home. Today, Angelica and her daughters deliver bottled water to neighbors who desperately need it. Marcella! Yeah? Do you want water? I brought a couple of cases. Okay, let me, let me. These people, you know, they can drive over there where is the water, you know, the donation. Because some of the people, as you see, they have broken cars. So what we do is we, you know, we try to bring water to them. All righty, girls. Let's just set them up. The 
this is what I like. I mean, people are really like open and and you know they get like a little treat. ¿Cómo se dice? Un abrazo, un abrazo. Thank you. You're welcome, Miguel. A ver cómo está ahí. Thank you. The church car park is converted into a makeshift bathroom where families without water can do things we all take for granted like shower and brush their teeth. The local county is gradually connecting homes to the main water supply, but no one knows exactly how long that'll take. In the meantime, Andrew Lockman from Tulare County oversees the tanker truck operation. These are the large trucks, anywhere up to um, 6,800 gallons or so. Um, and these guys, their job is to go to the water sources that are far away. These guys are doing all the, the running back and forth to the hydrants, to the sources. Um, and the smaller trucks can just zip in here, fill up, and keep going. For now, the truck drivers are the lifeline of this town. And I'm keen to talk to them. But for some reason, no one wants to talk back. It's just a controversial place to be to try and get anything done. For example, even the truck drivers, who are in some ways the saviors of these places by bringing them water and pumping them into these green storage tanks every day, they've been vilified, they've been abused, and they're so shy now that they won't even talk to us. I'm discovering a new battle line in California's water wars. The truckies are heroes to some, but villains to others. Would you mind terribly if I got a shot of just you putting the water from the tank into the other tank? Thank you very much, man. It's a big blessing. Thank you so much. I never thought it'd be this hard to get a truckie on camera. But they've been copping abuse in neighboring towns where they collect water for East Porterville. That's the thing about water wars. They're complicated and people get very protective. Just ask Robert Galvin, who co-owns a mini-mart near one of the reservoirs that used to supply East Porterville. And they were pumping water constantly, non-stop, 24 hours a day, taking water out of the damn neighborhood back here. And then we finally got tired of it because it was causing all kinds of ruckus back there. And it just made me angry. It made the whole community angry. And we all had right to fight for our water. What did you say to the truck drivers? Oh, uh, well, I can't say it on TV, but I mean, they, um, they cussed them out. And um, they even had roadblocks where they parked their trucks in front of the tankers and stuff where they couldn't either back up or back forward. And so finally we said, that's enough. We need to take the legal stand and, and do, a t uh, do a petition. And now they're going out to the nearest town to go grab more water, but now they're no longer grabbing it from us. Where's Angie at home? Yeah. Robert's lucky. He has water, but his business hasn't escaped the water crisis. It's come to the point that it's gotten so progressively worse here in Central Valley. So we're at the point that we're gonna end up selling this at the end of the year and we're gonna move somewhere else. We haven't decided where. Water is becoming more precious than gold. By 2025, it's estimated two thirds of the world's population will face water scarcity, with water predicted to trigger global conflicts. So you'd think rain would solve everyone's problems. Other roadways also washed away by more than eight inches of rain in some places. Winding rivers on the way to lakes and reservoirs. Enough this month to end Northern California's five-year drought. The end of the drought in California made headlines around the world. When I first came here, Owens Valley looked like this. And now, a few months after the winter rains, the place is completely different. We just had a great winter. A lot of people are calling it an extreme weather, you know. 
to me it, it's how the winters used to be. There's all kinds of little dry lake beds throughout the valley floor and they're all full now and the creeks are running like they're supposed to be. However, the snow melt hasn't solved the water issues in this valley. The water war continues. That this is great to see, but this runs right into the aqueduct down here. It goes and to LA. It goes to LA. But we we have a big water problem to begin with. So this is they could be doing all kinds of stuff to make it better, to fill up the aquifers, to keep it in the valley where it belongs, but they're taking it out. They're still taking just even more water out of the valley. I keep saying fill up the lake, of course they don't want to. And so we'd like to see it stay here. In a strange irony, this area is now in a state of emergency because of the excess water. Authorities fear a deluge into the lake will wipe out the water sprinklers that control the dust. The sprinklers that cost $1.5 billion. So they put all this time and money and effort into settling the dust. Now they got water coming that could settle the dust. It's that simple, but they're doing everything they can to stop it from coming on the lake to destroy the infrastructure that they have that, to settle the dust. <laughs> Hugh definitely isn't convinced that the snow melt will bring calm to California's water wars. He's preparing for what he calls water getting. Bit more protection, you reckon? That's it. Yeah, you pack it in, try to get a watertight seal. When it rains, the water runs off the highway, comes around the bend here, and then it all ends up in my front yard. And you can see on the house how it's tilted. And, uh, it's the poor house has been through hell this last year. The house is no jam. It's been here since 1918. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, it's home. It's home, yeah. And it's going to be paid for next year. And I was hoping then I'd have a few bucks every month to spend on it and try and fix it up a bit. Hugh was embroiled in a complicated legal battle over alleged contaminated water, which was settled out of court. He also believes the street is sinking because of the pressure being put on groundwater supplies. The system is just being overused. There's a lot of pressure on this resource for sure, huh? Yeah, yeah. the water's a new oil. <laughs> have you thought about what you would do if you did have to move, if the house fell over or flooded? Yeah, this isn't all about leaving, it's just, it's about staying. California is in a cycle of ever more serious droughts, broken by more intense storms. No one knows what's next. Just north of Hughes House is the tourist town of Lone Pine, a popular gateway to adventure in the Sierra Mountains. In this local outdoor shop, we stumbled across yet another person who believes the water war is coming. You need water to survive. I mean, that is like the most imperative source of life and that's it's going to be a tough one i'm 34 years old it's going to be you know it's going to go down in my lifetime for sure um what is like water wars you know big water wars some say california doesn't have a water problem it has a water management problem. But if the world's sixth largest economy can't manage water, what chance do the rest of us have? For those people that have water up there, lots of water, conserve your water, because you never know what's going to happen. Love your water, because it's just like an oxygen. If you don't have an oxygen, you can't breathe. You can't breathe, you'll die.